handing it over to you. So just give me. No. Okay. Good afternoon and thank you to the India Foundation. It is my pleasure to be here and connect with you again. A warm welcome to you all joining us today. Thank you to you all who have joined this webinar titled The Law of the Sea, Upholding a Rules-Based Order in the Indian Ocean between the Geopolitical Cartographer and the India Foundation. The Geopolitical Cartographer was incorporated a little over a year ago in Sri Lanka, and the focus of the, the research institution is the geopolitics, international economics, and maritime affairs of the Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, and the connected landmass, which are redrawing the global political order. The GC is a nonprofit and nonprofit making and nonpartisan think tank with and a regional public policy research foundation. It operates from Sri Lanka with a distinct external focus and outreach. The focus of the research foundation is the Indian Ocean and its littoral states, including its emergence as an epicenter in the remaking of the global political order, the creation of a single strategic maritime space resulting from the interconnection with the Pacific Ocean and other global developments having an impact on the mission of the foundation, such as we are discussing today. I would like, also like to take this moment to say that India has been a strong source of help to Sri Lanka in this difficult economic crisis, which we are all experiencing. Some of us still have occasional power cuts, so please bear with us. We as Sri Lankans must say thank you to India for the help thus far. Sri Lanka shares a long history with India. It is therefore meaningful that our oldest ally has proven a true source of help in this difficult time. I would like to thank all of our guests for joining us today, especially our esteemed panelists, Dr. Rohan Pereira, former legal advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Sri Lanka, former member of the UN International Law Commission, and Sri Lanka's former permanent representative to the United Nations. He is also a scientific advisory committee member of the geopolitical cartographer. Dr. Anirudh Rajput, member of the UN International Law Commission and the India Foundation, and Rear Admiral Jagat Ranasinghe, former Vice Chancellor of the Kotalawala Defense University and also a member of the SAC of the GC. I would also like to thank our moderator for today's session, Vice Admiral Anup Singh, veteran of the Indian Navy and member of the India Foundation. With that, I would like to hand the floor over to Vice Admiral Anup Singh to begin the session today. I think uh, before Admiral, uh, we hand over to Admiral Anup Singh, I'll request uh, Dr. Raghav Pandey from India Foundation to just give a two minutes introductory address and hand it over to yep. the chair. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, Rishan, for the kind introduction. Uh, I would uh, like to welcome all of you on behalf of India Foundation to this webinar. As we know that uh, upholding a rules-based order in the realm of law of sea has become much more increasingly important uh, these days. So this webinar, I hope, uh, 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 brings valuable insights to all the participants. And uh, at, even at the policy level, we are able to materialize into something meaningful. Uh, on behalf of the foundation, I would like to especially welcome Dr. Rohan Pereira, Dr. Anirudh Rajput, and uh, Rear Admiral Jagat Rana Singhe. I, I hope that uh, 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 we are able to uh, materialize this into something very concrete. Thank you. Over to you, Admiral Anup Singh. Thank you, Rishan and Raga. Um, I think uh, we are well on time and therefore I won't waste uh, too much uh, in delving into the subject for which we have three eminencies. Um, the theme for today's webinar, as you all know, is the law of the sea. Uh, upholding a rules-based order in the Indian Ocean. Um, but let us briefly look at the law of the sea uh, for the sake of the audience. Um, the law of the sea, which is a critically important branch of international law, concerned with public order at sea. Um, as you would all be aware, much of this law has been codified in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or in Clause 3, uh, signed almost uh, four decades ago in December 1982. Uh, and since then, 
<clears throat> UNCLOS has been described as a sort of a constitution for the oceans. There is um, just no doubt that it was a result of one of the most laborious conferences lasting almost nine years between 1973 and 1982, um, representing an attempt to codify such laws that were customary till that time. It came into force in 1994 after it had been ratified by, I think, um, 60 odd countries. And by the turn of the millennium, about 150 countries. Having mentioned and defined the subject in the theme, that is the law of the sea, let me now turn to the predicate which is uh, upholding a rules-based order in the Indian Ocean. What was the need for codification of customary law uh, with, with, with attempts having been made twice earlier um, in, in class one and two? Uh, why was it felt so important immediately after the Second World War that um, an attempt should be made to codify these rules. Um, you're, all, you're all aware that the most common view that one or perspective one gets about the seas is shipping and fishing, uh, which remain to this day the two primary vocations exercised in the use of the sea. Uh, as time passed and technology progressed, many other mineral resources, including natural gas, oil, sand, gravel, diamond, gold, precious metals, and now sulfides, started getting discovered and extracted from the seabed. With the development of trade in the 20th century and the inexhaustible realization of the use of the sea, the classic principle of freedom of the sea was pushed into the background. And then came what is mistakenly called the territorialization of the seas, thanks to China's nine dash line as the most recent and the most um, conspicuous example. <clears throat> that brings me to an explanation to, a, to, a, to, a, to a mention of the PCA verdict of 2016, which we are all uh, familiar with. Was UNCLOS 3 of any use in terms of law enforcement in that verdict? Um, similarly, do we have any means other than a host country's maritime constabulary forces like Coast Guard, apart from the Navy, and primarily Coast Guard uh, in case of countries which have formed Coast Guard as secondary maritime forces for, um, for law enforcement in their maritime zones? Um, so is there, is there any means other than a host country's maritime forces to check IUU fishing, which has been a menace since 1982? In fact, in China's case, since the 70s, it has been exploiting um, um, the exclusive economic zones of certain many East African countries. Um, and and, and that, that, that actually continues till this day. Now to discuss and suggest measures for a rules-based order in the Indian Ocean, not just limited to these two things that I mentioned. And <clears throat> we have three uh, uh, eminent uh, personalities who are, who include Dr. Rohan Pereira, who is a scientific advisory committee member of the geopolitical cartographer. Uh, he's also been the former legal advisor to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sri Lanka. Um, Admiral Jagat Rana Singhe, former chief of staff of the Sri Lankan Navy and a vice chancellor of, and vice chancellor of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University and Dr. Anirudh Rajput, who's been a member of the UN International Law Commission from 17 to 21. He was also a chairperson of the drafting committee for the 69th session of the ILC in 2017. We couldn't have asked for a better panel. May I therefore request 
the first mentioned in sequence of uh, these speakers, Dr. Rohan Pereira, um, to make his presentation. Over to you, Dr. Pereira. Thank you, moderator. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thank you, thank you. First of all, let me thank the India Foundation and the Indian Ocean Cartographers of Sri Lanka for organizing this webinar and inviting me to be a panelist at the discussion. It is most appropriate that our two organizations, India and Sri Lanka, have picked on the law of the sea because this is one area where both India and Sri Lanka, both bilaterally and multilaterally at the Third United Nations Conference, worked very closely, virtually coordinated their position on a range of issues which uh, came up for discussion. I remember both Sri Lanka and India enacted their maritime zones law way back in 1976. And when some of the concepts were still being discussed in the like the exclusive economic zone. It was incorporated into the domestic laws of India and Sri Lanka. And uh, also the Indo Lanka maritime boundary agreements were the first in this part of the world to have settled the, the, their boundaries to the 1974 and 1976 maritime boundary agreements in two countries. We know in how in other parts of the world these are given rise to numerous problems, but in that sense, both India and Sri Lanka were, were pioneers. So with that background, just a few, now that it has been referred to in some, some detail, a, a brief overview of the legal regime of the old ocean. As you all know, Development of the classical law of the sea goes back to the 17th century. Uh, in particular, Hugo Grotius, the eminent Dutch jurist, who developed the theory of Mare Liberum, or open sea. And this was, of course, he was he was the legal advisor to his government and to cater to the interests of Holland, the maritime power of the day, that they had unimpeded passage in different parts of the ocean. The, as you correctly mentioned, Mr. Moderator, there were two previous attempts at codification of customary law, the 1958 and 1960 Geneva Conference on, they were dealing with specific aspects of the sea. There was a convention on the territorial sea, convention on the high seas, convention on fisheries. Now, therein lies the problem why it was not possible to have to, to settle the whole range of issues which had to be left for the historic Third United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea. To a piecemeal approach, it was not easy to get into a bargaining process where each country or each group could, could, could negotiate on the basis of what is important for them. So in that sense, the third United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS III, uh, which came, uh, first met as the peace use of the Seabed Company in 1974, and then ultimately resulted in the historic Law of the Sea Convention was adopted. And again, let me mention that the chairman of the Law of the Sea for the eminent Sri Lankan ambassador late, Shirley Amar Singh. So Sri Lanka has been very much closely engaged in the whole process. The, what are the key issues that were left? First of all, the two conventions or the two conferences fail to reach agreement on what is the maximum distance of the territorial waters. 
at that time there were countries claiming from three miles some claiming six miles some claiming 12 miles and some latin american countries claiming as much as 200 miles as their territorial rules for which they had absolute or they claimed absolute sovereignty that was one another issue was meaning of the phrase right of innocent passage the conventions will repeated the customary law position that passage is innocent as long as it is not prejudicial to the peace the order or security of the person now that that was there was no further illustration or verification of that phrase but it was mere left to interpretation by the coastal states as to why what is prejudicial to their peace the order or security so that was not a very happy situation and this is an area where unclose three made clear clear progress first of all it was possible for unclose three to settle the question of what is the maximum distance of the territorial sea it was possible to settle maximum distance at 12 nautical miles and there was a reason reason was that if states were prepared to accept 12 nautical miles as the maximum distance of territorial waters over which you have sovereignty they were prepared to consider concede a distance up to 200 miles over which a coastal state would have sovereign rights as distinct from sovereignty sovereign rights over resources living and non living resources so that was the distinction and that is how concept of the eez or the exclusive economic zone came into existence one you have sovereignty up to 12 miles and there from the low water line up to 200 you have sovereign rights important thing is this was a compromise formula in respect of other matters all the high seas freedoms like freedom of navigation freedom of overflight and so on were preserved in the eez so in that sense it had some of the characteristics of the territorial sea because you are talking of sovereign rights at the same time preserve the high seas freedoms which states normally enjoyed uh, the high seas so that was the uh, achievement of the um, of unclos strait now this was described the eez concept was described by the international court of justice as a sui generis as of a sui generis character so it had some of the characteristics of high seas some of the characteristics characteristic of territorial sea and therefore national court of justice this have this as a compromise par excellence compromise par excellence another aspect i think that is worthy of consideration is the the in the context of maritime security is that unclos 3 gave meaning and content to the phrase innocent passage as i said it took it was left for subjective determination by the coastal state still it was to be determined by the coastal state but it also article 19 also lists a range of activities which shall be considered as being prejudicial to the peace good order or security of the coastal state these are these, these elements include any threat or use of force against the sovereignty territorial integrity or political independence of the coastal state or in any other manner in violation of the principles enshrined in the un charter the any exercise or practice with weapons of any kind see 
any act aimed at collecting information to the prejudice of the uh, defense or security of the post. So any of these activities will not be considered to be, if, if, if a vessel engages in any of these activities, it would not be considered to be innocent passage. In other words, passage must be limited to transiting waters in the normal course of navigation. So in that sense, it, it added some clarity into this concept. And there's also the question of the uh, convention also uh, obliges states to ensure safety of submarine cables. As you all know, submarine cables are extremely important in the context of present day communications, particularly internet. Uh, we, most people think it is satellite, but no, it is the submarine cables which ensures the efficient functioning of the, the internet. Another innovation which the UNCLOS 3 brought about was the concept of right of transit passage through international straits used for navigation. Already you just referred to the nine dash line and so on, how China sees. Now, what happened here was that the, with the extension of the territorial waters, because that's under classical law, limited to three nautical miles, going up 12 miles, the, the waters in these international straits now occur the character of territorial waters. Now, this was not acceptable to the major maritime use. So then you come under the control and jurisdiction of the coastal state. So they evolved a new concept of right of transit passage. That is, as long as a vessel is exercising the right of transit passage for the purpose of transiting from one part of the high seas or the exclusive economic zone to another part of the high seas or the exclusive economic zone, uh, then the special regime that was carved out to ensure free navigation. Uh, one example is territorial waters. We all know uh, yeah. submarines cannot traverse underwater. They are surface. But under this regime, special regime, they could travel beneath the surface. Another important uh, area which requires some discussion is the importance of marine scientific research. As you know, enhancement of maritime domain awareness is a key aspect, particularly for developing countries. And here, maritime marine scientific research acquires an important character. Now, no, nowhere in the convention is the term marine scientific research or MSR defined. So there again, one has to interpret it at practice and so what constitutes MSR? Would naval vessels qualify as carrying out your research activity? Now, the convention provides where MSR is carried out in the EEZ or in the continental shelf of a coastal state is subject to the consent of the coast consent regime. But it is a qualified consent regime. Because it goes on to say that such consent shall normally be granted, shall normally be granted because peaceful uh, scientific research for peaceful purposes is to be encouraged and facilitated unless there are certain factors such as where a scientific research project interferes with exploration and exploitation of marine resources, living on non linked resources, construction of artificial islands and installations. So 
this is what we have got through the LOS negotiations. There were issues that had to be had to had to be sorted out through compromises, and that spirit of compromise certainly was there at that time in 19 from 19. 1982, when the convention was adopted. Perhaps I'll stop at this point. Maybe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pereira. Um, you mentioned a couple of important points, and I think uh, uh, I will leave uh, clearance of doubts by many people, some of some of the audience um, who may have them. Uh, but an interesting point you raised was about Hugo Grotius uh, from Holland um, and his Mare Librem uh, uh, epistle. Um, in contrast to Hugo Grotius, just after his thesis was John Selden from the UK um, who opposed it and, and, and produced um, uh, a thesis titled Mare Clausum, and that was that was the principle of the British at that time to say um, <clears throat> uh, we own those seas that we rule, or, or or terms to that effect. And finally, who won? Hugo Grotius. But unfortunately, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that uh, things like the nine dash line are once again trying to. Um, Put a spoke in the wheel of the uh, principles enunciated uh, by, by Hugo Grotius. Um, the other uh, point that you made was about some states asking for three miles, six miles, 12 miles, and even 200 miles. Um, as far as my memory goes, even countries like Peru, Chile, and Ecuador asked for 200 nautical miles, and I think they were taking a cue. Uh, from the Truman Proclamation of 1945, um, which claimed um, all rights of exploration and exploitation of the seabed up to the end of the continental shelf. And it was declared as a as good as a 200 mile zone. Uh, fortunately, on class three, put a stop to any extensions of territorial sea beyond 12 nautical miles. You are very right in saying that. Um, <clears throat> you did make a mention um, about um, innocent passage being one of the hallmarks of one of the one of the important cornerstones of uh, clause three, which finally permitted a particular zone which was beyond the cannon shot rule of bunker show, uh, three nautical miles, and uh, the whole idea was to allow the law of the land to apply in this 12 nautical mile width so that, um, so that uh, the, the coastal state could exercise certain rights for its own security. Um, I'll now request the second speaker, Admiral uh, Jagat Rana Singhe, to please make his presentation. Thank you very much, sir. I believe that I'm loud and clear. Yes, Admiral, you are. Thank you, sir. I'm just trying to share the presentation so uh, it's easier and make me easier for me to continue. Uh, I cannot open my presentation. Uh, Admiral, could you try share screen and then go on to the presentation? Share screen. Oh, uh, yes, sir. I'll try. Green label share screen. After okay. you click it, you will find your own presentation slideshow on. Uh, that has been disabled, sir. Oh. 
was disable the participant screen sharing no no i don't think the organizers can disable anyone's uh... prashan can we request you to kindly enable admiral rana singh's uh, screen share yes i think it is enabled if not i can also share it uh, his presentation okay. myself but i get the message call host disable participant screen sharing anyway host disable participant screen sharing Admiral, if you could try it. Now it's okay. Now, now it's okay. yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry for that. No problem. Moderator of the webinar today. Vice Admiral Anup Singh sir, other distinguished speakers and the audience. It is an honor and privilege to be a part of this important webinar addressing the UNCLOS United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea as a rule-based order in ocean governance today. And my main focus will be on the areas beyond national jurisdiction. That is basically the area and also about the high seas. Uh, I will let my slides speak much more than me to be very precise on the subject and also due to the time constraint. As you know, all the conventions, treaties, agreements are rule-based orders in which rule is basically a set of broad governing principles and order in the sense of peaceful condition and the stability. The rule-based orders in global perspective has to protect the state sovereignty, preserve peace, and curb excessive use of power. Every order, by definition, is rule-based. When there are no rules, no governance, but order is subjective to the perspective of the user. That is where the ratification is for. The three Cs are very important. When there is no rule, there will be competitiveness, and because of the competitiveness, the confrontation, and then to sort this out to issues, you need the consensus. So basically, it is the three C's concept for the rule-based orders and unclosed United Nations law of the sea. I think that has follow, it follows uh, those lines. As depicted on the slide, United Nations law of the sea As, sorry, as depicted on the slide, the United Nations Law of the Sea is the constitution for the ocean, as well said by the moderator, sir, uh, constitution for the ocean, and is a globally accepted maritime legal order, governs the ocean with 168 signatories, addressing maritime challenges and issues. As explained in the beginning, collectively, the marine areas beyond national jurisdiction comprise the high seas, that is the water column beyond the national jurisdiction, and the area that is seabed beyond national jurisdiction, but with different governance structure. As of the article, 86, def definition of the high seas as shown in the screen. I mean, the unclosed article 86. The area that is one of my main areas of the subject or the main one of the main topics of the subject, the area. So as the area, it is the seabed, ocean flow and subsoil beyond the limits of national jurisdiction that uh, explained in Article 1, paragraph 1 of the Law of the Sea Convention. And it is uh, eminent because the area has been taken as the first 
article to be discussed or so that is not to be discussed but of course uh, uh, to uh, show its importance the area has been discussed at the not rather discussed but in the grocery of terms it is article 1 subpara 1 oh. and let's see states can extend its continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles i'm talking about the high seas and the area again states can extend its continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles to a limit of 350 nautical miles or more in some cases that is uh, explained at article 76 of the law of the sea yet the water column about the extended continental shelf is considered high seas and beyond national jurisdiction Higo Gautius, 17th century treaties, as explained by the moderator, sir, uh, the Mare Liberum, was the free and open character of ocean space. The concept is high seas, free for all states. As of today, the freedom of high seas is at a question mark, even though Mare Liberum is being accepted as global common. Codification of high seas freedom is also as shown in the screen. There's another two important articles that is article 88 and 89 of Law of the Sea Convention that articulated the rule-based order with regard to the high seas freedom and is also described on the screen. Further elaborating above, according to the Article 87, Sampara 1 of the LOSC says the high seas are open to all states, where the coast is low landlocked. The most, the key word of here is the landlocked. Freedom of the high seas is exercised under the conditions laid down by this convention and by other rules of international law. The freedom of high seas further strengthened to freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight, freedom of lay submarine cables and pipelines as well explained before. And so and so forth as shown in the screen. The other most important factor is the due regard. Due regard, which is the limitation in this rule-based order of unclosed concerns for the interests of other states. That is where I said competitiveness, the three C's, competitiveness, uh, and then confrontation, then the consensus coming in. Control measures for, for the users who misappropriate the freedom of the ICs is subject to due regard for the rights under this convention with respect to activities in the area. The conflict in the making in view of competition or resource exploitation, or otherwise is also addressed in the convention as shown in the screen. The freedom of the high seas, is not an absolute freedom, but a balanced one, obviously. Balancing of high seas interests is also important in sustainable use of sea. Nuclear weapon testing on the high seas was considered by some states, but certain states are not because of it. bilateral agreements as violating the freedom of the high seas. They consider it violating the freedom of the high seas. Article 90 of the LOAC provides that every state, whether coastal or landlocked, has the right to sail ships 
flying its flag on the high seas, but subject to the flag state jurisdiction. The LOC imposes considerable responsibilities on flag states. So using the flag states, the control, controllable measures are being imposed in. Flag states have its responsibility and they are their responsibilities are as shown in the screen. They have to maintain register of their flagships, assume jurisdiction under their internal law warships, internal law warships, officers and crew in respect of technical admin and social matters. And also to take measures to ensure safety at sea with regard to construction, manning of ships, use of signals, etc. Similar to the flag state responsibilities, the ship by itself required to maintain a rule-based order while it's on high seas, as Article 98 of the LOC directs that the captain of the ship has to assist and rescue life at sea when, it, when in distress. To render assistance to any person found at sea in danger of or being lost is a primary uh, duty of a captain of a ship who is uh, sailing through high seas. Flag state juris jurisdiction, which is the measurable rule-based order, is further emphasized in un unclosed as shown in the screen. The lack of effective implementation and enforcement of flag state responsibility is a critical shortcoming in high seas government. In 2006, the IMO subcommittee on flag state implementation has enhanced the flag state responsibilities on marine pollution, certification, and record keeping. These measures are very important in responsible fishing and in riders' passage. The impact from shipping in the high seas are virtually unstudied and shipping regulations need to be reviewed and updated. So basically, the rule-based order is being measured and also controlled in different angles. The MAPL and other legal instruments are being used, maritime legal instruments are being used for the control measures by the UNCLOS. In earlier days, human activities on sea has, seas has been very limited, but during the recent past with technology know-how and the industri industrialization, the sophisticated use of sea by larger vessels with endurance resulted the steady increase in global maritime trade that leads to greater usage of the high seas. So it is the tempo is high, activities are high because of the uh, because of the uh, industrialization and uh, use of sea for many activities happening around the world or the global. Threats to the high seas and area are mainly from the IU fishing. I'm discussing about the threats. Uh, that may pose in high seas and area. Uh, high seas and area are mainly from the IU fishing and rule-based order to control such has been projected through various means, like UNCLOSE itself has uh, certain articles, the manage sustainability, et cetera, and also the UN Fish Stock Management Agreement, regional fisheries commissions like in the uh, yeah, Indian Tuna Commission, ITC, etc., and also the control measures through port state, coastal state, flag state, and uh, market measures are being taken. Uh, uh, so those are all the control measures that have been established to control the overfishing. The bycatch is also another aspect that 
we all have to keep in mind that that has impacts to populations of species that are not being targeted by fishes. And that's a threat to the ecosystem. Threats are further being analyzed and explained as of the as depicted on the screen. Threats to the high seas and area also could be through the marine scientific research and bioprospecting. Bio and such have the potential to adversely affect marine species and ecosystem through noise, physical disturbances, and introduction of alien elements into the high seas environment. During the pre introduction, it will the beginning of the webinar, it was, it was explained about the bioprospecting and also the marine scientific research, but there is, there should have a control, uh, otherwise that will make a lot of harmful and uh, negative uh, aspects into the uh, marine environment. Though the rule-based order on high seas governance and regulatory framework is in place, but has many gaps. These gaps have to be resolved through the agencies as shown on the screen. Basically, those gaps, like I said, the threat to the area and the high seas and also to the uh, navigation regimes of uh, UNCLOS, the, the threats probably could pose through fisheries, shipping, biodiversity, protection, criminal activities, solars, etc. <clears throat> these things, these threats need to be mitigated and managed through the Food and Agriculture Organization or the IMO, otherwise the CBD Convention of Biodiversity, and also the criminal activities like UNODC, etc. Conservation of biodiversity in high seas and area is also addressed in the convention and other legal instruments. They do support the sustainable use of resources, exploitation and exploration as such. The con conservation and sustainable use of marine bi biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction is increasingly attracting international attention as explained previously. As scientific information, although insufficient, reveals the richness and vulnerability of such biodiversity, particularly in seamounts, hydrothermal vents, and cold water coral reefs, they need to be protected. Unrealistic, unrealistic exploration and exploitation will be a negative uh, or will bring uh, negative outcomes into the marine environment. International law framework and legal instruments are very vital in conservation of uh, in biodiversity in the area beyond the national jurisdiction. The LOC sets out, uh, out the rights and the obligation of states regarding the use of the ocean, their resources, and the protection of marine and coastal environment. Although the LOC has rule-based order, does impose important duties like no, this notably environmental protection on those that exercise high seas freedom. It is other sectoral treaty regime that regulate a range of specific issues such as fishing, wildlife protection, shipping, and seabed chronic.
I conclude my presentation with the regional approach to mitigate the threats and conservation demands on the resource. The regional possible regional approach, the ways and means as shown in the screen. The cohesive approach through regional level could be one way of supporting the ocean lawmaking agencies and the rule-based order, like UNCLOS to be the effective constitution of the ocean. The demands on regional approach is as, is as shown in the screen. These are the obligations of regional approach to protect and uh, protect the rule-based order of the UNCLOS. The seas are vast, hence could lead to anarchy. If the rule-based order is, hence could lead to anarchy if the rule-based order is not followed in a unified manner. The world has seen a lot of prosperity during the last three decades due to relatively unimpeded trade and commerce through the ocean. This needs to continue. Continue trade and commerce not only through sea lines of communication, but through fair exploration of natural resources. The adherence to a rule-based order in the ocean will restrict competition and thereby avoid and limit conflicts, and hence good order can prevail. The challenge is to commit all the nations, especially the powerful nations, agree to a common ocean-based architecture that needs consultation and consensus, which depends on developing habits of cooperation among nations. Hope that we can achieve such by working towards genuine consensus and also with the regional approach. Thank you very much for lending your ears and I have concluded my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Admiral Rana Singh. First of all, uh, Rishan, can you uh, now hear me loud and clear? I'm told some participants- yes, I can hear you. Can the participants hear? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can hear too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Admiral Ranasinghe, for um, covering those areas which are normally not covered, including particularly jurisdictional rights and responsibilities, responsibilities of the flag state and so far as a rules-based order, and that too in our area is concerned. Uh, certain um, important issues I need to highlight that you had covered in your presentation. Um, the first uh, thing, of course, in some of the initial slides that you covered um, was the uh, abbreviation LOSC, Law of the Sea Conference. Um, in jest, I would like to say that um, ever since 2016, uh, PCA verdict on China versus Philippines, uh, sorry, on Philippines versus China, Philippines was the petitioner, um, I have been using the acronym, acronym LOST, Law of the Sea Treaty, and the acronym uh, adequately explains what has happened to the Law of the Sea Conference. Um, but that was only said in uh, just one important issue that you highlighted was the ills of overfishing. I think we all need to pay tribute to uh, Gunther Pauli, who of course must have had abundance in royalties by now with his first book, particularly on the blue economy, uh, which said 10 years, 100 innovations and 100 million jobs, just so rightly said. But the blue economy pertaining to the maritime domain, um, the first example he cited, if I recall correctly was fishing um, uh, of Morocco. And um, he specifically said that, um, you know, as an example, he camped there and found that it is not just overfishing. What we fishermen were doing was so much harm to the future of species 
that they were only catching adult fish. And he therefore recommended, which has now been followed by many developing countries as well, that fishermen should be taught that only baby fish must be caught so that the biological cycle is retained and is protected. Uh, the, the, the other thing that you mentioned uh, in one of the uh, last few slides uh, was about <clears throat> You know the the damage being done, uh, where where there are international organizations like FAO, IMO, UNODC, etc. Um, and so far as fisheries is concerned, despite initiatives by FAO and despite pronouncements by FAO year after year as to what has been the actual catch by uh, declared catch by China as against certain think tanks in this field. Uh, from Europe having uh, said that China actually catches almost eight to 10 times more fish and the rest is all illegal. Um, similarly, biodiversity protection you mentioned, and the greatest damage that has been done is by building of artificial islands, as well as uh, destruction of corals, which takes at, uh, at times thousands of years to rebuild. And so far as UNODC is concerned, I just need to remind participants over here, uh, what kind of damage occurred between the years 2005 and 2012, uh, insofar as piracy in the Gulf of Aden is concerned, which has shifted its focus now for no uh, sensible reason to the Gulf of uh, Guinea, which is not all that rich in fishing, but coastal countries in the Gulf of Guinea are so dependent on uh, transit fishing and on, and on their own trade. Uh, the UNODC had um, said that between the years 2008 and 10 alone in the Gulf of Aden, in the state of Babel Manda, the cost to international shipping, and that means global GDP, was almost $18 billion. $18 billion. And to give you just one example of what was the direct result of piracy and its and, and transnational crime in so far as Somalia was concerned, uh, Somali fishermen and turned into hooligans was concerned at that time, was that Lloyds had declared almost nine times uh, the insurance rates during that period. And shipping companies had said that crews after Port Suez had started claiming, uh, started demanding two to three times their salary till they left the Gulf of Aden. So thank you very much indeed. And now we move on to the last speaker that is Dr. Anirudh uh, Rajpur. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vice uh, Admiral Singh. Uh, allow me firstly to send my warmest greetings and heartfelt prayers to all our brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka. Uh, we may be separated by the sea in between, but we are connected by our rich culture, which has enriched both the countries over the centuries. So we are not just two individual states, but we are to a great extent one culture. So it's uh, really the same feeling of hurt that we all have in India looking in the situ looking at the situation in Sri Lanka. So I first begin by conveying my regards and, and my prayers to, to our brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka. I must also thank uh, the geographical cartographer and uh, the India Foundation for organizing this seminar and trying to bring about awareness about the importance of a rule-based order in the field of the law of the sea. Of course, the starting point for a rule-based order on the law of the sea is the UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, by whichever acronym you call it. But what it achieves to do is to create a rule-based order. And it's important to understand why a rule-based order is important, or what does a rule-based order really mean? The nature of international relations is fundamentally power-based. It is therefore rightly called power politics. But the vagaries of the power politics are 
that the smaller states are unable to protect themselves against the bulwark of larger states who are always looking for their self-interest. Now, if it's a different situation, if a large state is not just pursuing its self-interest, but functions based on principles which are in communitarian interest, then there is no need of law. But the need of law arises the moment when large states use the system of international relations purely for their individual motives to rip off smaller states of their existence, of their uh, riches and their natural resources and so on and so forth. It is the task of a rule-based order to ensure that there is parity between different participants of the international legal system, which means states which are of different size, different population, different economic growth, irrespective of all that, they all to need to be, ought to be treated at par. And that is what law achieves in the context of international law. It is therefore important, although very tempting to say that there is no law, international relations is just about power, politics and interests. But what we can't forget that states come together, create treaties, have developed customary international law, abide by those rules because it is in mutual interest. Now, the law of the Sea Convention is the most prominent example of such rule-based order. And it's also important to understand why this rule-based order was brought about. We heard some references to, uh, to Hugo Grosch's uh, Mare Libellum. We also heard the references to Mare Clausum by Sheldon. But let us not forget why these concepts were developed by whom and to serve whose interests. As uh, Ambassador Pereira very rightly pointed out, Hugo Grotius didn't write an academic book. He wrote a legal advice to the Dutch East India Company because they had confiscated a Portuguese ship which they wanted to sell off as a, as a part of, of a prize in a prize court. And they were claiming that in the Indian Ocean, that's where they all wanted to trade, that is where we are, India and Sri Lanka are lifeline. It is these jurisdictions where we should have the freedom to go and trade. It was for the purposes of exercising freedom of navigation in the Indian Ocean that Hugo Grotius wrote this so-called treatise, which has become a treatise today, Mare Liberum. Interestingly, immediately after writing this text, he was negotiating with the British. And then he started arguing the British, used the British argument that the seas can't be open, seas can't be free, and the seas have to be closed. So we have to be careful about our obsession with these European scholars because all these concepts, which was very rightly described by Professor R. P. Anand as battle of books, simply for serving self-interests. So we have to be a bit careful and take all these discussions with a pinch of salt. What we need to take seriously is the architecture of UNCLOS. And why is that important? Because the first convention on the law of the sea, which resulted into four conventions, which are known as the Geneva Convention on the Territorial Sea, on the Continental Shelf, on the High Seas, and, <coughs> and, and in relation to fisheries, these conventions were basically driven by the developed countries. The process of decolonization had only begun, and the developing states, if one could say that, were on a back foot at these negotiations. A lot of the concepts which were percolated were essentially those which served the colonial interests and were aimed at perpetuating colonization. But UNCLOS is a watershed moment. Since 1958, that is when the first UNCLOS happened, up to the third UNCLOS, that is 1982, we saw a sudden rise of number of states in the international community. Almost two thirds new states emerged. These new states were inevitably from Asia and Africa who were colonized in the past. It was these Asian and African states which got together along with the Latin American states who were already suffering from the North American domination, who got together and realized that times have changed. We can't be made hostage of either of these arguments of, of Mare Liberum or Mare Clausen. We need a clear cut rule-based order which protects the interests of developing countries. So UNCLOS is one of the greatest achievements 
of the solid solidarity of what is normally called the third world or the global south. Therefore, one has to be very careful when they say UNCLOS is insufficient. Of course, there are some things which UNCLOS doesn't address, but there's need to amend UNCLOS. Let's change this. Let's change that. Don't let's not forget that it has it has a history and there is a lot of if I may say blood and sweat of international lawyers from Asia, Africa, Latin America, which has gone into creation of this institution. And I'm glad that uh, Ambassador Pereira began by paying a tribute to CF Amar Singh. And I think also, I should also pay a tribute to him because he was the first president of the negotiations of UNCLOS. And of course, an eminent international lawyer in his own right, writing in different as on different aspects of international law. So the UNCLOS that we understand today is, is an outcome of the third world solidarity in order to protect its interests, to protect the interests of the developing countries. The most important issue which was settled at UNCLOS was territorial sea. Developing states, the, the developed states, the colonizer states, always insisted on three nautical miles. The reason why they insisted on three nautical miles was because then they could take their warships just outside the territory, territorial sea and continue their spying activities along all these smaller developing states. In fact, during the UNCLOS negotiations in the early phases, the delegate of the United States said that if I go back with this proposal of 12 nautical miles, my Department of Defense would never agree to it. Of course not, because it wouldn't have provided them the opportunity of spying on, on the developing countries. But the developing countries got together and said, we need 12 nautical miles where there can be no interference of any sort. Of course, you have a freedom of transit, you have a right of innocent passage, but the passage has to be innocent and it should not contradict the public order of the coasts. So there is the balance. Coastal states need to have exclusive jurisdiction of the 12 nautical miles. Of course, the nature of the jurisdiction exercised beyond 12 nautical miles is far more limited because it's not sovereign as Ambassador Pereira explained it very well. It is only exercise of sovereign rights rather than exercise of absolute sovereignty. Absolute sovereignty is that the coastal state would have rights to do same same rights as it would have on its, on its own land territory. But that's not the, the nature of the continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone. The continental shelf and the exclusive economic zone ought to be used only for exploitative purposes that too with a due regard to allow other participants of the international community to use those parts of the sea to the extent that they're allowed to, which is mostly through the freedom of navigation. So that's a critical element that this rule-based order conceptualizes that states can make legitimate claims up to 12 nautical miles, but they can also make claims up to 200 nautical miles, not of absolute sovereignty. So that's something important, and that's what most of the developing states have adhered to very carefully. The recent arbitral award, or rather, which is now it has been a few years away, the, the, the award rendered by an arbitral tribunal constituted under Annex 7 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and administered by the Permanent Court of Arbitration. The arbitral tribunal had to look into some issues of construction of artificial islands as to whether states can create artificial islands and then claim a territorial sea. Now, let us get one thing clear. There is no problem with the rule of 12 nautical miles of territorial sea. The problem is where are those 12 nautical miles measured from? UNCLOS requires that those 12 nautical miles are to be measured from low water mark on the coast or an island which is capable to have vegetation, survive population, and not just uh, 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 a low-lying uh, low watermark, uh, not just uh, uh, a structure which is under the sea, submerged under the sea on other occasions and sometimes above the sea. And what, what was considered by the Permanent Code of Arbitration is that you cannot construct artificial islands in order to then claim that now by creating an artificial island, I'm going to start calculating 12 nautical miles from where I've constructed an artificial island. Now look at the travesty, if this was allowed, then state could simply go into the sea, construct an artificial island, and then say now 12 nautical miles is mine. So the 12 nautical mile rule has to be understood reasonably. There's no problem with the rule. Of course, there's a problem with in the way in which it has been misinterpreted and sought to be misapplied in certain situations. 
It's quite interesting during the drafting of UNCLOS, China very vocally said that artificial islands should be excluded from the placement of, uh, of base points because that's an inappropriate place to place base points. So there is an issue of, uh, of, of, of having a proper rule-based order. And a rule-based order is not just about setting out the rules. It's also about complying with the rules in their letter and spirit. Now, I do understand as an international lawyer, I often come across people who come and tell me, yes, but there is no police to enforce international law. Well, that's the nature of international law. Would we be happy being an Indian? Would we be happy if some police comes and drags uh, the government of India and says, well, you are in violation? Come, I'll, I'll, I'll punish you. Would we be happy? Of course not. Because international law is based on principle of reciprocity. We can't forget that we would not want the other person to be treated in a way in which we would not ask to be uh, want us to be treated. So we have to be always careful about what enforcement mechanism ought to be there. It's nice to get emotional and say, well, we need to have some world court, we need to have some world police. That's very nice uh, science fiction. But unfortunately, that doesn't work in the real world. In the real world, one needs to find realistic solutions. Unclause for its time in the 90s was a realistic solution. For the first time, it came up with the concept of archipelagic states allowing the island states to have baselines around their islands and the internal waters as their, uh, their, their internal waters with rights of other states of transit passage through those waters. So that time, it was certainly a progressive instrument which took into account the interests of, 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 of the developing country. As times have changed, more issues have emerged. The question is, are we able to address those issues and how well we absorb those issues? My preceding presentation, uh, presenter, uh, Rear Admiral uh, Rana Singh, spoke about BBNJ, Marine and Biological Resources Beyond National Jurisdiction. That is an issue which is being currently deliberated at the United Nations for a new potential convention. And that's where we think somehow that the developing states are not as organized as they were before. Probably their interests have changed. But even if their interests have changed, what they can't forget is a rule based order is in their interest. And there has to be a balance of all of that. A rule-based order has served, the, especially India, Sri Lanka, and, and, the, and the developing countries from, from Asia in a, in, in a very strong manner. For example, protection of the marine environment. And that was one of the greatest fears that these big ships from developed countries would pass through your coast, co uh, your, your coast pollute uh, the sea, and then what happens? And therefore, UNCLOS is a very specific regime to protect the marine environment. UNCLOS is a regime to, to resolve maritime delimitation disputes peacefully. And I think India, Bang, uh, Bangladesh is a, is a very good example of that. India and Bangladesh decided to go to ICLOS tribunal. Although India is geographically a larger country, politically influential, it could have arm twisted, it could have said, drawn some, some lines and that said, these are our lines and <laughs> give these territories to us. This India did not do. And I think that also shows that India rises as India, Indian power grows. It continues to be a consensuous power, a power which is careful about its power, but also ensuring that its power is used for the global good. And therefore, I think India Bangladesh arbitration is a very good example. So while we cite the unfortunate instance of the award of permanent code of arbitration not being abided by. I think we should also cite the example of India Bangladesh uh, it lost decision where uh, India decided to, uh, uh, to, to comply with, uh, with, with that arbitration. Sorry, it was not a it lost decision, it was an NX7 tribunal. The it lost decision was between Bangladesh and Myanmar, which is also a good example of where two mid sized countries can also get together, adhere to the rule of law, and comply with it. And in the arbitration, India had to give up large sections of its claims, and India happily gave it up. Because if we invest in a rule-based power, it ensures there is durable peace and security. And it's a choice. If a state which is becoming powerful doesn't want to abide by rule of law, it is going to create disruptions. If it does not comply with, with rules, other states are not going to comply with it. And what we have is a state of havoc. That is the last thing that the world needs. But before I conclude, I'll make a one, one very brief observation about the history, and that really explains how law of the sea could sus sustain so well in India, and in the Indian Ocean, and particularly in South Asia. The first instance of maritime trade 
can be found from 3000 BC, 3000 before Christ, between the, the Harappa civilization and Babylon. So that was the first instance of trade. From 3000 BC, right up till the 16th century, till the Portuguese emerged, till Vasco da Gama came to, to the southern coast of India, most of the seas were peaceful. Except for three instances, there were no instances of seas being used for non-peaceful purposes. The first being the, the conflict between the Chola and the Sri Vijaya. The second between Changais Khan, who was trying to dominate uh, the seas by using force and suppress other, other states. And the last was again by China, unfortunately, the Chinese emperors trying to use sea, use sea to use force. Except these three instances, we find from 3000 before Christ till the 16th century, no use of force, rare use of force. They realized the importance of using the sea for mutual prosperity, and they used it very efficiently. But after Vasco da Gama, in fact, when Vasco da Gama came to India for the first time, and while he was about to leave, he didn't even pay his taxes and just went off by bombarding some of the installations on the coast, which were meant for enforcement. And that's the point when the European powers emerged. That's where the rule of law was destroyed. That's where the peaceful system, peaceful trade was destroyed. That's when this conflict between Mare Clausum, Mare Liberum was simply created to serve their individual purposes rather than any sense of commitment. It was only, and it was interesting, in Europe, United Kingdom was arguing for, uh, for Mare Clausum, closed seas, but in the Indian Ocean, it was arguing for open seas because it, the Dutch were already there. The Dutch were speaking of, uh, of, uh, of Mare Liberum there, and they came and they were speaking of Mare Clausum here because it was serving their interest to close the seas. And this conflict was perpetuated unless the, the, unless the, the British Empire turned out to be, success, to be the successful one, colonized the whole of India, and then the rest of Europe stood behind them, and then they stood behind the, the so-called grotius concept of Mare Liberum. But we can't forget that it was unclosed where, in a sense, our intellectual forefathers got together to find a system which was in the interest of the developing countries. Now the question is, as we look into the future, as there are more and more areas of international law relating to the sea which are unaddressed, IUU fishing is one example, piracy on which we have, have had several ad hoc resolutions of the Security Council in relation to Somalia, uh, or issues of protection of, of, of the marine uh, environment, and the most important one, protection of biological resources beyond national jurisdiction. Now, as we look into the future, the question is whether we as Asian states, we as India and Sri Lanka can get together, understand what is not just in our petty self-interest for the time being, but of course in our interest in the long term and in the interest of the international community, and be and play a more constructive role. So with due respect to, to the very learned chairman, if a uh, moderator of our session, if I may say, there's nothing lost till the time the international lawyers on this panel and, and, uh, and in India and Sri Lanka are alive, energetic. In fact, there is a lot to be gained, but I'm not sure that really fits in, in, in any acronyms. But I must uh, end here. I'm happy to take questions and it was a great pleasure to, to address. And of course, it was a Great pleasure to be on a panel with uh, with uh, these eminent panelists, and of course, Ambassador Pereira is a very near and a dear friend. And of course, it was good to be moderated and guided by 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 Vice Admiral Singh in this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajput. I I still say what I said was in jest. L O S T, an American acronym, Law of the Sea Treaty. And the acronym said it all in 2016. Was it lost? In fact, at that time, I used to say a number of times, nine years was so laborious after the Second World War. And so patiently did uh, every country's uh, uh, committee, uh, a group of representatives, including from India, I think there used to be, I think, eight or nine, including one late, uh, Rear Admiral O.P. Sharma, who was part of the committee, which uh, a part of representative committee from India, which used to go, that it is worth the while to spend another nine or 18 years for an unclosed port. A lot of non-binding, as I call them, that's not, that's not what is mentioned anywhere. Um, 
uh, articles which really have been troublesome when it comes to people like China. Perhaps magisterial powers could be um, could be awarded to certain tribunals or the ICJ or wherever else to suo moto take action against those who are violating. I mean, uh, that was that was the, uh, the the gist. But thank you very much for a very very um, a solidly concentrated dose. And I think you gave a very apt example of India Bangladesh. Uh, uh, I think we went to PCA and that too at the behest of uh, Bangladesh. Initially, we were keen on going elsewhere, but the moment Bangladesh said we, we prefer the PCA, that was a broad chest that India presented to say, fine, you want the PCA, we have no objection. And we were prepared for everything. And you very rightly brought out that that's the way to go in so far as the rules-based order is concerned, in so far as big nation versus small nation is concerned. We gave up, I think, 25,000 or 40,000 square kilometers. I don't remember exactly how much. And that was in 2014, just after Myanmar lost its case in its loss uh, to Bangladesh. But that is an example that I gave in while presenting my paper to the International Free Review, where the Chinese were there in full force with two ships and a large number of delegates in uniform, um, where I said that, you know, um, just look at what we did, not a whimper. When Bangladesh sought it, all we said was that it has a concave coastline. That means that its EZ comes into a small triangle within the fan of, of the Bay of Bengal. So it was only right for India to, 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 to show uh, a broad chest and say, well, here it is, we lend a shoulder to you. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Rajput for having. Just as an aside, um, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned a very, a very interesting fact about between 3000 BC and the 16th century. Uh, one of the famous battles at sea was the one at Salamis Bay in 480 BC, uh, which is cited time and again by people all the way from the US Navy to the Papua New Guinea to say that that was the first instance where naval vessels, those days under oars, were used uh, by the um, Phoenicians in trying to overpower the Athenians in Salamis Bay near, near ancient in Greece. Um, but that is, that is just an aside uh, to, 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 to further expand on your, on your piece. Thank you very much once again. Now the house is open to questions. Um, Who is going to collect the questions because I'm not very computer savvy. I hope it is a very legitimate excuse on my part. Um, uh, who, um, we'll let you know, sir, in case somebody raises hand or somebody uh, types a question. Uh, so those willing to ask questions could raise hand. There is a provision for raising hand uh, in the thing. Just do that. And even the panelists could have questions or comments uh, yes. to give on. Yes, very much so. Very much so. There is some uh, question uh, from some Sunny Seharawat. Uh, if you have a question, you could uh, unmute yourself. Oh, may I talk? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, good evening. I am uh, Riyad Bigal uh, Paul, retired from Sri Lanka Navy. And uh, this question goes to Dr. Rajput. Doctor, you said. Uh, the mutual prosperity. And as you, as in today's context, what is being challenged more intensively? Is it the EZ or the high seas or just the internal waters and the maritime infrastructure of small states? Why the rule based law? Thank you. 
if I can take it right away, thank you. Thank you for the, the interesting question. It's, a, it's quite a broad question, which entails a lot of things. But let me try to narrow down on a few specifics and, and then see how, how it can be addressed. Now, there is one thing for sure, at least, that in theory, a state cannot claim an exclusive economic zone or continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles. Now, in the first UNCLOS, uh, one of the four conventions, an important convention was Convention on the Continental Shelf. Now, this Convention on the Continental Shelf was pretty much based on the Truman Proclamation, which was the customary international law that states can have a continental shelf up to 200 nautical miles. But then what happened is during UNCLOS 3 negotiations, a lot of these Latin American countries, and if I remember them correctly, it was Argentina, Mexico, and of course, Peru, they said, we don't have a continental shelf. Because as those uh, who are aware of, of geography and geomorphology, they would know that continental shelf uh, is a geographical concept. It's a term of art. It's the nature of the column under the water. So it's not the sea floor. It's not called the sea floor because it's structurally different in terms of its geology and geomorphology as opposed to the continental shelf. And continental shelf is important because under the hard rock, you often find the, find the hydrocarbons. So a lot of these states did not have a continental shelf. So they say, we, we don't have it. You need to compensate us. So one of the greatest contribution of UNCLOS is the concept of EEZ. Prior to UNCLOS, there was no EEZ in the world. Like there was no 12 nautical mile territorial sea. Some people said 3, 6, 12, 6 plus 6, 6 territorial sea plus 6 contiguous zone. So in a sense, the contiguous zone idea became a bit subsided, however, it's still there. It is you up to 12 nautical miles of the territorial sea, and then up to 12 nautical miles, you have the contiguous zone. But for those states who didn't have a continental shelf, they got at least uh, 200 nautical miles where they could use the, uh, use the water column above, above, uh, above the floor. Now that allowed them to have some exclusive control and most importantly, to exclude others. What was happening is the developed countries from the West had the technology. They had just started developing these large seagoing trawlers. These trawlers would go in the sea and basically scrub everything, all fish and everything up to 200 nautical miles because they say, well, beyond territorial sea, it's all ours. So by getting that exclusive right, coastal states, developing coastal states stopped those other states from coming and interfering in, in their areas. Now, the problem is that UNCLOS doesn't address fisheries. And for political reasons, it's always impossible to get an agreement on fisheries. So there are some minor regulations, but they're not, you can't really say that UNCLOS regulates it. Of course, FAO right, issue some recommendations, how much cash, what's the problem. And it's such a sensitive issue for so many coastal areas. So it's doubtful that states would ever be in a situation to agree to something. For example, Japan was, was a party to the Whaling Convention and after it lost, lost the, the case before the ICJ, where uh, they were basically arguing that uh, we are not, uh, we are not uh, killing uh, whales, we are doing scientific research. But uh, those whales were being found in restaurants thereafter. So they say, well, that's not scientific research. So, and, and now Japan has withdrawn from the whaling convention because it doesn't want those restrictions. So fishing is always going to be a trouble area. But what we are seeing is China, for example, has been trying to declare these maritime uh, protected zone, military zones, where they're saying nobody else can come. Now, again, use of force ships is something out of unclause. Naval fish, uh, naval ships are excluded, provided they satisfy certain definition, which is pretty easy to satisfy. But to keep them out as well, China is trying to have all these zones and, and all these efforts. So in terms of law, the law seems to be quite clear, except on the issue of fisheries. But the issue is of, of implementation. So when some states start saying that, well, I'm going to draw my baselines not from where my coast is, but I'm going to start drawing my baselines, say, 100 nautical miles away from my coast and then claim another 12 nautical miles plus 200 nautical miles. That's a problem. And I think that's a problem that needs to be addressed. So in my view, it's not a problem with UNCLOS. It's the problem with misinterpretation and misapplication for which, of course, uh, as uh, I think Ambassador Singh, Anup Singh very, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Vice Admiral Anup Singh very rightly pointed out, it's international adjudication. 
UNCLOS already provides for the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice if uh, the parties have agreed to, if they haven't agreed, or they may agree to go to Tribunal of Law of the Sea where Myanmar and Bangladesh went. If they haven't agreed to any jurisdiction, they simply go to an X7 tribunal, except for maritime deal retention disputes, for which they have to go for conciliation. That's another big topic to discuss, but I won't get in there. But there, there is a mechanism, but it's ultimately, yes, one might say, what's the use of a paper decree? A judgment in my favor, what has Philippines done? But it allows Philippines to put international pressure. It allows other states to, although I'm not a big fan of this doctrine, but name and shame helps sometimes. So at least it allows other states to say, next time when some state starts saying that, well, we comply with international law, we'll say, well, here is a decision. And I think that's where India deserves full credit because it says, well, I went for, for, for an Annex 7 tribunal and lost and gave it up. And therefore, my record on rule of law is way higher than anybody else. So please don't come and lecture me. So on international fora in the United Nations and other fora, this gives a lot of strength. But So I do think there is a value. But uh, these are indeed complicated issues and, and we can find solutions. Thank you, Dr. Rajput. I hope uh, you have very well explained. Um, and, and, and I think um, uh, you are right in saying that uh, the greatest contribution has been EEZ, and those three countries are um, almost neighbors, as I mentioned in the beginning. I think Ecuador, Peru, and Chile couldn't find a continental shelf and therefore insisted after the Truman Proclamation, before the just during the unclause, that we need a territorial water of 200 nautical miles. But it's all been settled now. Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Pereira, you had a... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few, a couple of brief observations arising from the last intervention by Dr. Anirudh. Uh, on the EEZ, but there's a lot of literature that given the very wide acceptance of this concept, even while the UNCLOS was in session, as I mentioned, both India and Sri Lanka went ahead enacting domestic legislation. It is argued that concept of the EEZ has acquired the character of customer international law, quite independent of the treaty, so that the same treaty principle can be incorporated in the treaty, but it can also exist outside the treaty as a principle of customer international law. So much so that the United States, which rejected the convention because they could not accept part 11 on the deep sea bed, they said, no, but we are going to proclaim our 200 miles because they stand to gain so much. But that is customary. So that argument is being made. Uh, second thing I just want to flag that the convention also contains another Indo Sri Lanka achievement, the state special statement of understanding on the delimitation of the continental shelf in the southern part of the Bay of Bengal. This again at the law of the sea, both India and Sri Lanka urge for special treatment given the a uh, special geological and geopolitical character of, the, of that part of the sea. So that was uh, accepted. Now it's a matter of providing necessary scientific evidence on the purpose of sedimentary rock. And so forth. But I just mentioned that. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pereira. Which is the next hand that's been raised? Hand by Ms. Uh, Jagat Rana Singh, yes. Yes, uh, yes, I Rana, just could you, could you, yeah, unmute yourself. Yes, please. Uh, can, can you hear me now? All right, sir. Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, to add a little to the Dr. Anurudh uh, uh, regarding the uh, con conservation and management of the living resources. Article 116 to 120 of uh, Law of the Sea has provisions uh, that basically right to fish on the high seas. Uh, then the conditions have been applied on uh, resource uh, conservation of the living resources of the high seas, and also the that discuss about the marine mammals, and then uh, cooperation of states. That is Article 118 discuss about the cooperation of states in the conservation and management of living resources 
so there are about more than five articles have been discussed on uh, fishing as well as its conservation. Um, but I found a very little, uh, my observation, when the LOEC or the rule-based order has the unclose, when that brings a descriptive article with a lot of descriptions, then they have went, I mean, it has been well studied and rule-based order is well established. But if the article is very crisp and uh, limited to one simple paragraph or such, or not described as much, it means uh, there is a conflict, there is a problem, or there is a further development, et cetera. So that was my observation uh, on the rule-based orders in this uh, unclose. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral Hossa. Any other questions? We still have about 20 minutes to go. There is some message on the chat box by Mr. Roshan uh, Kolatunga. Uh, if you'd like to put it across. or even Sunny Saravat, there are two comments if somebody has an issue. If I may, uh, with the permission of the chair, I see an interesting point about uh, <clears throat> small states in the, in the Indian Ocean region. Please, please go ahead. Thank you. I think that's really a, a, a point on, 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 on use of political influence. So that's really a politics a issue of geopolitics about uh, how states interact with each other, less of, of the law of the sea convention. But I think there's another critical issue which arises from that, uh, that question, I think which also needs to be highlighted, is about the threat of inundation uh, because of sea level rise. So the, so the climate change is causing, as you, we all know, rise in the, rather the melting of, of, the, of the glaciers, uh, uh, and the ice is increasing the level of water and letting the sea levels rise, which is going to inundate uh, and some of the states are going to submerge. So the small island states in the Indian Ocean region, of course, many more in the Caribbean are under a threat of disappearance, including countries like, uh, like uh, Bangladesh and of course, uh, not fully, but at least some parts of the coast of countries like Sri Lanka. Might, uh, might go underwater. And then the question is what happens to the rights under UNCLOS? Because UNCLOS didn't think of this situation. And there's an interesting observation which uh, the tribunal made in, in India, Bangladesh, where Bangladesh was saying that eventually my, my shores are going to go underwater, so give me a larger share. And the tribunal said that we're not going to get into what happens in the future. We're just going to draw baselines based on where your base points are today and where they will be in the future is not for us to decide. Now that's, I think, something critical. So one way to look at it is all these smaller states, if they go and get their baselines registered now, and then say that these are our baselines, they are now fixed. So give us uh, 12 nautical miles plus 200 nautical miles and extended continental shelf, shelf wherever we are capable of, then they can at least conserve those entitlements. But if they haven't made those deposited those information, then they might be under a threat that whenever they go, they might have already lost their territories. The law is unclear on this. Uh, it's one of the tricky areas, but nobody expected uh, sea level rise to come up the way it has come up and the way it is uh, haunting us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajpu. Um... Any other questions? Someone is, yes, I think Nidhi Bahuguna has asked a question. Piracy must be having some state support. It is quite surprising this issue is never discussed in mainstream media. 
except when it is an Indian citizen or shipped at the pirate in, in, the, in the hands of the pirates. Um, <clears throat> would anyone amongst the speakers like to comment on this? Let's take the example of mass robberies in the Malacca or piracy in the Gulf of Aden. There wasn't any indication, any any instance of any evidence of state support anywhere, neither in the Malaccas for obvious reasons, nor in the Gulf of Aden. In fact, the state from where the where the menace of piracy emerged in the Gulf of Aden was Somalia, because uh, there was a complete absence of governance, as you know, since 2002. And uh, no matter how many resolutions. Um, came out of the UN, of the UNSC, uh, there was little that could have been done in so far as control of this menace was concerned. So I don't think there was any state support in the case of uh, any of these instances. Perhaps one could draw some kind of a conclusion that when these pirates in the Gulf of Aden went to the other shore, that is Yemen, uh, there was no check on them, but that is yet another story uh, that Yemen has uh, had no control and no, no way of uh, keeping, keeping watch on its own coastline, as you saw in 2000, in the year 2000, when USS, uh, what was the destroyer's name? The USS, um, which, which got hit by Al-Qaeda in Arabian Peninsula in a suicide. He was cold. USS Cole. Cole, 37 lives lost and so many other names. And one year after 9-11 in 2002, you had just off Aden Harbor, um, a, much, uh, a tanker which had, which had just left Aden was again attacked by AQAP. So that really, uh, one doesn't know whether there was state support, but certainly there was a quiescence in, in keeping its coastline in check. If, if I may supplement, I think uh, yes. you're absolutely right uh, that we don't have instances of state support. But what we do see is there are a lot of uh, <clears throat> insurgent non-governmental groups, uh, armed groups, which use piracy for their political purposes, <clears throat> not necessarily to establish a state, but just to perpetuate violence. And uh, Somalia was, was an ideal example where the Security Council stepped in and then... Uh, <clears throat> It issued uh, some, it had some chapter seven resolutions with the cooperation of the transitional government. But in history, we find a lot of examples of, uh, of state sponsored piracy. The British Empire entered the race by basically through piracy. So, the Fra so, so Sir Francis Drake, who was the first individual who was so greatly honored, and even today in the United Kingdom for what he contributed to the country, he was a privateer. So privateer is a term which was used for pirates who would go steal from others and give back to their sovereign and get a license that you're allowed to do piracy. So Francis Drake, Drake used to attack uh, the, the Portuguese, uh, the, basically the Spanish ships, which would go, would go to Latin America and bring uh, gold from there. So he would steal from, from those ships. And that's what became eventually, so now they are the masters of, of freedom of navigation. But in recent history, we don't have example of state-sponsored piracy unless someone wants to learn from, from the history and, and, and create the problem again. Thank you. I think there are no more questions. Any more questions, comments uh, from the audience? We could take it on. Else, uh, we request Rishan to probably uh, start winding up. I'll now request uh, Diksha Goyal to propose a vote of thanks if there are no more questions or comments. We, have, we could wait for about five minutes in case anybody wishes to ask questions, comments, any raising of hands or anything like that. In time, I wait for technology to finally serve tea from the geopolitical cartographer and the India Foundation to all participants and the panelists and the chair. Um, perhaps 
that technology should come very soon, virtual mode. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, sir. I think it's been a very, very informative session. In fact, uh, extremely informative. Uh, it's been, I think, it's a good beginning as far as the bilateral relations between India Foundation and International Cartographers is concerned. Uh, I'll now request uh, my colleague, uh, Diksha Goel, to kindly present a vote of thanks. Good afternoon. On behalf of India Foundation and the Geopolitical Cartographer, I take this opportunity to thank our esteemed speakers and the moderator, uh, Dr. Rohan Pereira, Dr. Anirudh Rajput, Rear Admiral Jagat Ranasinghe, and Vice Admiral Anup Singh for taking out time and addressing us this afternoon. We are truly enlightened by your address. I also want to place on record our deepest appreciation for Mr. Rishan De Silva uh, for pulling this through. And we hope to see you more uh, for, uh, for our, all our future endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you to the panelists as well. Thank you. It's a lot to all those who have joined in today. In fact, I, I would want to express a gratitude to all the participants who have taken time to attend this webinar. It's been extremely informative. I'm sure all of them go from here uh, better informed. And thank you for call, uh, joining us from across the ocean, especially Dr. Rajput, who's, I think, joining us from Europe. So we are really grateful to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.